AJ Benza. I'm going live with Vicky Abelson on her show Game Changers. How are you, babe? Not not hearing you. I don't hear you now. I can't All right, you're not hear no. you weren't hearing me because I'm trying to deal oh, with the right. fa- with the Facebook right. cacophony that because you don't have to deal with this on no, your podcast. No, I have no so. idea. I have no idea what that means. Okay. <laughs> That's a, a lot of work. A lot of work. I'm telling you, it's crazy making. But you do um, you've been doing huh? it all how many years you've been doing this? You've been doing it all for years, right? You know, I've been doing, I was doing Women Who Write since right. 2007, but right. then I started doing this show um, a year before you. And as a matter of fact, you did my podcast and then yes. you started doing your own like very soon after. Uh, yeah, I started in 2017. So we're- uh, I'm a year ahead of you. Okay, so I'm six years in now. Um, well, the, the the Me Too movement was the impetus for me. I just knew so How much so? of what was going on. Well, I was- a a good friend of Harvey Weinstein's. I worked with him. He, he got me a book deal, a TV deal. Uh, I was always there for Harvey. I never knew there was rape involved in his life. I just thought he was a typical studio head that, you know, had girls and had sex regularly because that's what they do. Right. But there came a point where he uh, began to ask me for help because there were people uh, talking about him. This is before Ronan Farrell put together the article. And Harvey texted me and said, meet me at the Four Seasons in LA. LA. I mm-hmm. met him and he said, look, they're doing a hit piece on me. I said, who? Because I don't know yet, but let's see if we can find out. And he offered to pay me some money, it was substantial money. And I said, okay, I'll look into it. And then I started hearing little whispers about rape. And I said, oh shit, if this is what this is about, I'm over, I can't help this guy. Mm-hmm. So I told him that. And he said, it's not true. It's all not true. It's all, it was all consensual. But, you know, obviously when the, when the dirt began to be revealed, we knew it was much more than, well, I don't know if anything was, maybe there were a few consensuals, but there are plenty of dirty, disgusting deeds. So, you know, I, we didn't talk again. We talked after he got out of the rehab and then before he went to prison, we spoke and he just said, AJ, um, if you were who you were back in the 1990s and me too happened, they'd have gotten you too. But I don't know. I mean, I never did that to a girl. I never roughed up a girl or forced her to do anything. So right. I think he was just saying anybody that was a playboy type, probably going to be rounded up. Um, who knows? I mean, girls lie, men lie, people lie. But in Harvey's case, he got way too deep in it. And uh, it's really, I still can't believe he's in prison for life. When I look at him and remember those days with Miramax and the Oscar parties and the movies, and he did say to me, if I wanted to talk about Ben Affleck, Matt Damon, and George Clooney, and I know all their secrets, Hollywood would shut down and fall down to their knees in one afternoon but I'm never going to talk because I'm not a rat. He claims that a lot of guys did what he did. Who knows? I don't know. I know a lot of guys breathed a sigh of relief when it was kind of over. Um, you might, you remember, I, I know you know Chris Noth from the old New York City days, right? Of course. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, he got a big... But I used to coach his son in soccer. And when I was telling him what's happening, it's funny. I saw like his mind moving and he said, how long do you think they're going to go back? How long will they check back on someone's reputation? I said, I don't know. Who knows? Depends if a girl wants to talk. I didn't know back then he had something to hide about these women who just came after him. But right. they, me, they attacked him and he's canceled now for all intents and purposes. I've seen him come back a little bit here and there, but it, generally it's like a two and a half year goodbye. We don't want you anymore. Then they, then they roll well, we, you back. I, I, you know, AJ, I'm a feminist. And to say that they attacked him, I mean, uh, no, no, no. I don't if, mean. If I don't anybody mean, did the attacking, uh, yeah, of course, of course. But I mean, yeah. they, oh, I shouldn't use what I know they what you're saying. From, they came from, and yeah. I mean, I, I was shocking because I know his wife, and we've been at their house, and you just can't imagine what they're going through in their household. Um, I don't mean. I think she's still with them, but it was touch and go for a while. Yeah, I, I think I read that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it doesn't sound like he was particularly surprised. Uh, that's yeah, that's the thing that got me. He didn't act like there's no. He didn't deny, deny, deny. He kind of just slinked away. Uh, yeah. But I felt it. I felt it when he said, "How long do you think they'll go back?" Yeah. And I thought that's a strange reaction to a story like that. How about you don't think of yourself being involved? But no. You know, I've never gone public with mine. I I, I did it in a very roundabout way, but a very very famous 
um, playwright director me oh. tooed me or tried to. And, really? Um, yeah. And it was totally using his power and his prestige and all of that stuff. And I don't, you know, I, I don't, I don't think, unfortunately, that men had an idea that this kind of stuff was so rampant. You know, uh, I've heard so many stories now: men coming out with a bathrobe, or men coming out with a towel on their waist, dropping the towel. You know, I, I never imagined those kind of scenarios. But then, I also say the other side of my brain says. Well, why did you go to the big director's house for an audition at nine o'clock at night on a Friday? You know, like making keeping business like you go to his house in Malibu. Well, you be careful. And you do have to be. You know, this is this is a very slippery slope because when you are trying to make look, you know, you and I have both mm. been in a position where we've wanted to get to the next level from wherever we were, and sure. you know that we would do. And I don't, and I didn't do anything and neither did you, but right. you know what it's like when you're young and you're hungry and, and <laughs> somebody is dangling a carrot in front of you and, and you want to be in faith that it's going to yeah. be okay. And, you yeah. know, but so how did that impact you doing a podcast? You started to say that that's why yeah. you did it. Because I, uh, suddenly all these people were in the news that I knew an awful lot about, especially Harvey. Also, I have to say that it also, when Donald Trump decided to run, you know, I had big conversations with him. We used to be arch enemies. We fought and we became friendly again. So I said to my wife at the time, I have to tell these stories. This is too much. I have too much Harvey stuff, too much Trump stuff. I got to. So I was desperate to start something. And my buddy, Mike Agavino, who runs what Workhouse Connect, the producer, mm -hmm. he said, do you think you'll have enough stories? I said, Mike. <laughs> just put it on my just give me a microphone and uh hey, we're six years in. I'm still not slowing down with stories, that's for sure. So okay, so tell us about your podcast. Um uh Fame is a bitch, which now how come you didn't name it Fame Ain't It a bit? How come you changed it? Didn't, it didn't it didn't sound it didn't sound the right way on a on a show. Fame ain't it a bit throwing eight in just did it works for the TV show when I said it on commercials, but for the show, it's just like no, fame's a bitch, and let's go down the reason why it is. And, you know, it's funny. I call it fame as a bitch. Yes, a lot of it is Hollywood stuff, gossip. But so much of my show has turned into me telling stories, not even about Hollywood, about my family, about loss, grieving. We've unfortunately faced a lot of deaths recently from people we love or people we knew in the media or, or, or showbiz. And I tend to have a lot of stories about these people because I hung out with them. So sometimes you go, what can I talk about tomorrow? open a paper, so-and-so's dead, this one's in jail, this one's going to prison, this one's getting a divorce, and I go, oh, I could talk about this forever. I had dinners with him, I went to his house. So the show is more than not just me talking about Hollywood. In fact, my view, my listeners tell me they like it better when I just talk and be a raconteur about some of the stuff I've done or people, what people have done. I also dip into old Hollywood and talk about those scandals, which I'm, I've done that for years on the E! channel, but such a combination of everything. And then politics got so heated up, I launched a politics as a bitch a couple of days a week. We're still doing that. And uh, Patreon, I'm behind. I, I actually do one or two free shows a week with fame as a bitch, but five days a week, I'm behind a paywall at Patreon. And uh, that's where I give the goods. That's where I break stories. That's where I get more personal for, for my for my listeners who pay to hear me speak, you know, a little more special. You know, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't branched out. To, I'm still giving it away all over the place. I didn't like that. You know, I, I was giving it away. I don't I gave either. It away it's for terrible. A, I gave it away for a year. All right. Then I said to my buddy, all right, I want to launch a Patreon. You know, he goes, I don't think it's time yet. I said, it's got to be time. I'm ready to go. Let's make money. And we did well. You reach a plateau after a while. But then mm -hmm. they kept, he kept running my free show five days a week. And I said, no one's going to buy patreon if they're always getting me free five days a week they gotta stop this now it's a it's a gamble because people only hear your show when it's free they don't right just, you, know, you, you have to stay out there in some kind of capacity as a, as a free podcaster which i don't mind doing i let out seeds i reel them in i say some good so i give i save some stories for the free audience that, that might sometimes i give them a patreon episode to let them know what they're missing and they'll sign up for a month i mean it's five bucks some people pay a hundred some pay 25, but it's five bucks. I mean, it's 17 cents a day. You, you can handle that. You know, that's the way I feel. So I'll do a free show or two, but then when it comes to the Patreon, I'm a little more strict and a little more constructed in what I say and how I shape the shows.
So, so are you doing completely different shows on Patreon, or are you giving yeah. them a? Are you giving them no. bonus content? No, completely different shows. Completely so different, different shows. Different topics, different people. Once in a while, they'll run into maybe one story. will go both ways. I sometimes, if like recently, Danny Masterson was found guilty of rape, and I I, I predicted he was going to be found guilty years ago because I knew that creep. And I'll give that on both shows because it's just too big of a story not to cover. Right. But my Patreon listeners, you know, they remind me about things I got right that, you know, I got just just today. Johnny Depp has agreed to pay Amber Heard's million dollars to charity. He's paying it, even though she owes it. I printed that a year ago when this thing happened. I go, he's going to keep found innocent and he's going to pay her fines. He'll he'll cater his pocket and pay the charities to make her not look as bad. And he did that today. Oh, yesterday. Because he's a good guy? Well, I think he's a good guy with flaws. I mean, I know Johnny mm-hmm. to be a flawed person like most of us are, but he's not a, a, a vicious uh, person. I never believed Amber Heard at all. I know it's not easy living with a drug addict and a drunk. Of course not. I think she beefed up some claims. Mm-hmm. A lot of us a lot of us know what she's up to and how she had affairs behind his back. So she just she came across so bad in court that the court of public opinion just said, no, this stinks. You don't, you don't look honest. Mm-hmm. And people love Johnny. They just love Johnny Depp. He's one of those actors. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, okay. Okay. So I, let's talk about some content that you've been talking about. Let, well, I don't know if I want to get into that right now. First, I want to talk about you, AJ. I want All to talk right. about how your life has changed because oh my like, you're, you're <laughs> like, everything's changed for you. So much yeah. has changed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so what was the what's the impetus? You're in Chicago now. Which... In Chicago, I'm in Chicago because uh, my sister lost her first son. He was 51 years old. He died mm. out of nowhere with first stomach ulcers, and you know he's I was his, I was his uncle at nine years old. He was born when I was nine. We had the same birthday. We, he lived with oh. me in California. Wow. I lived with him in California. Very close, more like brothers than uncle and nephew. I'm so Much sorry. More. Yeah, he worked all over New York City at all the all the clubs, bartended restaurants. So he he was a city guy. He came out to LA 25 years ago, like I did. Tried his luck out here. So I came out here for the celebration of life she had for him last weekend or so. Um, I'm staying here a few more days, and then I'll be heading out to Las Vegas, where I'll be staying with my girlfriend at the place she just got a couple of days ago. She had to get a new house. So it's all been like crazy. And obviously I skipped a big part, which is that I've been separated, soon to be divorced from my wife of 18 years, who has our two kids with her, my daughter and son, who are 19 and 15. So yeah, a lot has changed. I've basically in the last three years been living from Vegas to Chicago to Los Angeles to see my kids out of a suitcase with my little kid, with my dog, Tootsie, with me every step of the way. <laughs> she's, never she's never without me. Just like your daughter. Did so, you take her on the plane? Oh yeah. She loves the plane. She's uh yeah, she's a frequent flyer. She's been flying for three years. <laughs> so my girl, what happened is my I had a dog that died, a Japanese chin, a few years back, and I was on the show crying about my dead dog. Who doesn't cry about a dead dog story, right? <laughs> it it got people's hearts. This listener writes me on Facebook and says, Look, I breed shih tzus. I want to give you one. I said, Give me one. They're expensive. Do I can't accept that. She was just, oh, please, I want to do it. You help me. I want to help you. Your, your shows have helped me kind of stuff. I never met her, but I drove out to Death Valley. She came from Vegas. We met halfway. She steps out of the car with this little puppy, eight weeks old, and I saw her, and I knew, Vicky, my marriage was done. Wait a minute. Make that connection for me. I've always known the girls I'm going to stay with. I knew my first wife in high school I'd marry her. I knew I'd marry my current soon-to-be ex-wife 18 years ago at a nightclub I saw her and as soon as I saw Andrea that's my girlfriend's name I knew I mean my marriage wasn't good for a while that's I mean I didn't leave uh, you know this wonderful place I lived there for my really I was I was married for my kids more than anything at the end you know I was my son's coach for eight years in little league and soccer basketball football but I saw her and I said oh Jesus, I'm sunk. I love that. I'm going to fall in love with this girl. And I said, let me buy you dinner at least. Oh, no, no. I had to go to Vegas a couple of weeks later for a podcast. And I said, please, I'm in town. Let me get you the dinner and thank you. It was COVID time. Nobody was at restaurants. Casinos were empty. I lost. This this is the one who gave you the dog? Yeah, yeah. So 
nothing was, I mean, we, we, ate, we ate all over Vegas during COVID. I had a friend giving me free sweets. He's a big player. So we stayed at every beautiful suite at the Wynn, the Delano, the Bellagio, the whole floor we had to ourselves. So it was this crazy whirlwind relationship that I fell into and I don't regret one bit. In fact, I love it. And, you know, I'll, I'm, I'm certain that she'll be the last person I ever marry. Uh, I fell in love hard. And, um, you know, my listeners hear this stuff. My, I keep, I'm very honest to my listeners to a fault. They hear everything. Um, and so now your kids, so that means your kids know too. So how oh, are your yeah, kids, my, with, how are your kids with all this? They've been surprisingly okay. I mean, I think kids, many kids nowadays, when I was a kid, if people got divorced, it was shameful back in the 60s. Right. My parents did. It was yeah. hard. Oh, you did? Okay. I didn't go through my that My parents at all. did, yeah. All right. Well, mm -hmm. kids nowadays see it so often where the mom's got the house, the father's down the road in a condo, and it doesn't seem as big a deal to them. But it was. It wasn't easy. You know, my, my son cried. I cried. My daughter cried when I, when I thought this was happening. But in the end, they want to see their father happy. And you know what? The alternative would have been, I stay at home and me and your mother fight all day and all my that's not good for kids to hear either. And mm -hmm. they heard their fair share of it. So they're fine with it. They haven't jumped in and met her yet. We're going to go really slow. It's been three uh -huh. years. I'm uh -huh. not forced. We, we, we thought they might meet a couple of weekends ago, but it didn't work out. But we're just going to go on their timeline. Um, uh -huh. and I, was talking, I was talking to some cousins over the weekend, and two of them had fathers whose wives died. Their mothers died, and their fathers went off and found other women in their late 60s. Mm -hmm. And I said, what was it like for you? I never thought this would happen to me. And my cousin said, it was tough in the beginning. I didn't want to meet the woman. You know, we didn't want to meet her. That was my, that was my mom's man. But then you get older and they're married and you start to understand like, you know, we don't want to be lonely in life. We want to be loved and cherished and paid attention to. And we want to give love. If that's not happening at the home of your marriage. Then I feel very fortunate that I even found her. Because at my age, I'm 61 last week, you know, I mean, I don't look like I used to look. I used to cut a nice figure and shit. So now <laughs> I'm lucky. She's 15 years younger than I am. She's gorgeous. She's, you know, uh, it's perfect. It's perfect. I never thought, oh. I never thought I'd be a six. Like, I always thought, oh, after 40, you must look like a fool being in love at 61 with a new woman. Now I feel 35. And I love this younger, not, not I'm saying younger. She's an old soul. She has the same memories as I do of childhood. But yeah, we just hit it off. We hit it off perfectly. And I said to my, my brother-in-law had cancer 27 years ago. They gave him six months. He's had colon cancer three or four times and he keeps beating it. Wow. And, uh, they gave him six months, 27 years ago. And he said to me one night, because I said, he's like my father. I said, what, what would you do? He says, you were there for your kids. You were a good father. You protected your son. You were his coach. You got 20 years left. If you found a woman that makes you happy right now and the kids are okay with it, then go, go. So, okay. So somebody just asked, so Tova just asked, and I was going to ask this question myself. How's, right. how's your soon to be ex or are you divorced? Not yet. I'm going through okay. it. I'm looking into it. I'm so separate, but I'm looking at a divorce for real next month. Okay. So how, how, how is, how is your soon to be ex-wife doing? There have been times where, well, in the beginning, she was very upset. You know, mm -hmm. you, you, you leave a woman alone with two kids. It's, it's upsetting. Okay, um, now wait a minute. Did you now? I know you guys had tr. Uh, uh, yeah, you you and I talked frankly with each other right. years ago, right. and right. you were struggling. I was going. I had gone through a divorce. Yeah. So she knew things weren't. She called me. She called me. She she busted me. I don't know how, but she. I don't even care to find out how. Oh, well, the point is, she busted me, and um, all right, didn't bother me because I knew eventually she'd learn. I should have been the bigger man and told her ahead of time. I think I met someone, but. Many of us don't think that way. I wish I'd done it. It would have made me a little classier to her, I guess. But to her, for her to know I was carrying on an affair for weeks and weeks and not saying anything, she gave me an opportunity and I didn't take it. So now we're fighting now over some baloney, but it goes up and down. Sometimes she'll get mad at me because me and Andrew will be in a fight and she'll say, well, what did you do to her? I know it's your fault. So like sometimes we play with each other or we act decent on the phone. But other times, like this last few days, it's been pretty stormy. You know, there's support, money to pay, and there's all sorts of stuff you have to go through. You never thought you'd go through. Mm -hmm. um, so who knew Who knew I'd be learning this at 60, 61 years old? But here we are. That's life. Is, is, she, is she heartbroken? I think that she, well, she knew we weren't good together anymore. But her mother's also very sick and dying now. And 
I think a lot of things are hitting her at once. Her health is not the best. He has an autoimmune situation thing. So for this to happen at all was tough. Um, I care about her well-being, but there was no future anymore with her. We weren't happy together. And uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I love beauty and, and someone's loyalty and how sweet someone is. And this Andrea just you know, filled all those categories up to the brim. And I said, I'm not going to get this again. And I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not. So I took the shot and I'll be living with her next week. <laughs> Crazy. You know, yeah. never thought I moved to Los Angeles and then never thought I lived in Las Vegas, but here I come. You never know about life. I mean, it's crazy. I don't, sometimes I think the things we fear the most end up happening to us and we have to deal with them. When I was a kid, I hated writing scared me. You know, an essay, a term paper, I can't do it. Now I can't do anything but write. I've been doing it for years, but now I write my shows every day. I love to record and talk to my fam, my listeners. Um, See, I didn't. I, I never thought I'd fly a lot. I fly constantly now. It's like everything you thought you'd never do, right? It becomes your life, right? <laughs> you know, I was talking about this yesterday uh, in in a workshop that I was doing. That um, we can manifest that, that which we put our attention on becomes our yeah. reality, right? Yeah. So if we, and you have manifested many great things in your life that you only dreamt of, that you dreamt about that you never yeah. knew you'd get to do right and but it's the same thing with our fears we if yeah. we focus on our fears we make they they come yeah they do, they um, do. Yeah. so and i believe in this late this later in life love stuff going through it myself and well you're going yeah. through it it's uh you know you hear those you know, Frank Sinatra and guys saying love's more beautiful the second time around. You thought, ah, how could that be true? Is that really true? Does that really happen? And then when it happens to you, you go, yeah, it really happens. And it's wonderful. Now, of course, I have to balance the other one being pissy sometimes. If it wasn't for her being, and one day she'll stop being pissy. Um, so in the middle, in the meantime, I'm balancing a little bit of her voice in one ear because she wants to be pissy at times and then trying to give my all to Andrea. But I think that's just, I mean, you look around and a lot of men are dealing with that. There's so many, God, I've never seen so many divorces late in life. People aren't sticking in it anymore. Like they just, people are walking out of marriages. Kevin Costa just got filed papers the other day. Like he's 60, late 60s, right? I mean, he's still a handsome, you know, wealthy man. He'll do fine. But you know, these things are scary. You don't want to be alone in life. So I'm so happy I met the girlfriend because I don't want to be alone at 60 years old, 61 years old. And, you know, just, yeah, I, just a very quick, big change of life from going, cooking, cooking dinner every night for my kids to not cooking dinner at all, basically. I can't wait to start that again. So how, I, how, how is it now with you and your kids? How, how much do you get to see them and, and how is your relationship with them? And when I come to LA, I stay for like two weeks or so, and I get to grab a hotel, and uh, they'll come and stay four or five nights. My son is 15, so everything is basketball, basketball, football. We watch the games. My daughter's 19. She had a boyfriend for a while, so I didn't see her as much. She started a band. She's got two jobs. Wow. You know, she's really hustling and working her butt off. She, her dream is music. And uh, she got scholarship to college, but she didn't take it. She want, I said, you know what? If you want to chase the dream that badly – Take yourself some money and see how you feel about it. Because I would, I was, I put my dreams on hold after college. I was stupidly engaged to be married, and my ex-wife at the time told me that I have a year to make it as an actor. You can't tell somebody you got a year to make. I was so stupid. Like, okay, you know, I got a few soap operas, uh, turned a few heads, then suddenly the years up, we got to get married. So that always stuck in my chest. Like I didn't do what I wanted to do. Then when the divorce happened in '91, I did everything. Moved to Manhattan, became a gossip columnist, did movies, wrote books, screenplays, like everything I wanted to have happen just fell out of, out of the sky and crushed me. And I ate it all up. I loved it. In the last six years now, it's just been me alone in a room. As long as I got my laptop, my microphone, I can talk to anybody. So I've done this show in so many different places. And I love the fact that my listeners get to hear all my stories because they're right. We're like a family. We really are. I'm sure you have that with your show too. You got I your do. regulars who check in on me and text me and they're wonderful people. Um, you know, sometimes I'll say I'm sick, you know, AJ, take off. We don't need this. Okay. You work so hard. Take a few days off. I don't, of course, 
but it's nice that they're out there being that way. It, it keeps it gives you a reason to get up. Because the one thing about the podcast work, once you exit the working world where I used to be, it's very difficult to keep um, uh, yourself occupied without a boss or a manager or a coworker nudging you or something you got to do by three o'clock. It's all your own pace. And if you're not if you if you're not too careful, you can go off on that and and get a little flighty. There's something to be said for getting up in the morning, making your bed, putting on a suit, and going to work. Once you get out of bed in sweatpants, have some cereal, and turn your computer on, it's like, am I working? I know the check the check comes at the beginning of the month, but is this really working? You know, it's very strange. You know. So how and has that transition? Is it working out? You know, because I'm not. I have not turned. I have not monetized mine. I'm still just giving mine Why away. Why not monetize I, I know. I have to follow your lead. I have to talk to you on the side and figure out yeah. how to do this. <laughs> I, I was literally going live seven days a week during I the know, pandemic. It's too much. And, oh, well, and, yeah. Well, I'm sure, you know, you'd be surprised. Once we went to a pay format, I didn't know what to expect. And then suddenly you start to see, that, oh, wow, oh, they're paying, they're paying, they're paying 100 this one's paying 200 a month. Like, who are these people? It gets to be very exciting. And then it's like, I feel like I'm traveling around with my own concert audience and they follow me every day. Sometimes you lose some people. You can't get down on yourself about why they leave. I don't know why they left. Some people walk out of movies. Some people walk out on, on, on ball games. It's just the nature of people. The pandemic happened. People are saving pennies. They're trying to be careful with money. The economy's in the tank. Gas is $6. So you get all those things take, you know, take away your mind about, well, this is why they're not with me anymore, but then they go back up and there's just no rhyme or reason for it. So I try to be consistent with the shows. And like I said, to me, honesty is what they like the best. And I've made myself just never lie to them whatsoever. In fact, I'm too honest where I've got friends and family saying, I wish you didn't tell that story. <laughs> oh, well, sorry. I told it. <laughs> well, you, know? you and I are the same that way. Yeah, Wait, yeah. So, so, at what point did you go to Patron? You, you did that Patron, before the Patron, Patron. I went to, I went, No, first I was free for a year. And <laughs> so then you did I it before to, the pandemic, though. Oh, yes, yeah, 2017. And then about a year and a half later, we went to a Patreon as well. So my listeners were in a free yeah. show three days a week and Patreon five days a week. Mm -hmm. But I, li I, like, I like the work. I like the fact that it ties me down and makes me have to do something. Um, but so you're so, not airing live. You have people that no, are editing your no. show. No, there's no edits. It's not. It's not an edit. I'll 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 show uh, Mike the show at like four o'clock, five o'clock in the evening. I'll send it to my nephew, who's my engineer, and he'll upload it for six a.m. on the I, East Coast. So so no, are they uploading at the same time every day, or is it very no, different? Different times. Mm -hmm. We have to work with his schedule too. He's a cop. So he can't mm -hmm. always be like, he used to be home a lot. Now he's not with those crazy cop hours. Mm -hmm. So all of my buddy, Mike was living in LA about a mile away from me. Now he's down in Louisiana. So mm -hmm. we've all changed geographically, but right. we're, keeping, we're keeping it going. We didn't lose a step. So um, yeah, so it's, it's all, it's all going good. It's all going good. That's fantastic. All right. So let's, let's go back as um, yes, this, this, <laughs> this is, um, my COVID crazy family, as I was telling you, this <laughs> this uh, this incarnation of the show began in COVID because I was going live every day. And like you, I got away from doing what I was doing, which was only celebrity interviewing and started doing shooting yeah. the shit, which was basically me just talking like you right. about right. whatever I wanted to talk about. And a lot of it was very personal, yeah. is very personal. And we are like a family. Um, so... I had a point that I was going to here that I totally it's just lost. COVID. It's a COVID oh, COVID. Crazy. So COVID. the COVID craziness. Okay. So you were telling me before we went live that you've had it four times. Yeah. Okay. Three, yeah. Three times since I'm vaccinated. I only got vaccinated once and one booster. I'm not doing it anymore. I didn't want to do it, but I had such bad. My first COVID when it was really bad turned into COVID pneumonia. And I was eight days in ICU. Really bad. Like touch Was this the bad. first version of COVID? Yeah. yeah. It was touch and go bad. Matter of fact, the nurses told me if you'd been here six, seven months earlier, we didn't have the stuff to save you. You know, I, you would you would have been on a ventilator like the other people. So oh. I missed I missed that first wave of the deaths and the craziness. When I got there, they had the medicines, the steroids, everything was done, everything was tweaked right, and you could feel when the good medicines hit you. Oh yeah, now I'm now I'm feeling better. But for five days, it was scary, Vicky. 
Yeah, when you got home. AJ, when you got it the first time, did you know you had COVID? Did you know what was going on? It's funny, my girlfriend and I were hanging out in the hotel and uh, having a cocktail. Both felt tired, but who knows why? And uh, next day, I'm going. Yeah, I'm sweating in bed. She's sweating. I said, "Do you think we have this? We, uh, really, we have this?" So we got tested. Both of us had it at the same time. She had to drive back to Vegas. I had to go to the hospital because I called Dr. Drew Pinsky, a friend of mine. Uh-huh. I said, uh, he's had it. He's had a rough, rough go of it. I said, what do I do, doc? I don't, you know, I'm not feeling this. I'm positive. He said, buy an oximeter, that thing you put your finger in to measure your blood, uh, uh, oxygen blood. Right. He said, it should be in the high 90s. I think I was 91, 90. That's 90. bad. Yeah, yeah, that's he bad. He said, go to an ER right now. And they admitted me. She drove back to Vegas feeling like shit. You know, to drive four hours with COVID is horrible. And I'm in a hospital. Now you're all alone. No one visits you, obviously. You're in a glass room. It's just very depressing and scary. And I would lose my breath just getting out of sitting up in bed. I lose my breath. Pneumonia hurts. People forget if you don't have pneumonia, it hurts your chest, your rib cage. It kills you. So I said, I don't want that again. Because like I said earlier to you, I had pneumonia around seven years ago out of the blue. I just got pneumonia. I never got that before. Never smoked a cigarette in my life. My left lung was filled. 30 days in the hospital. They tried to go through my back. They couldn't reach it right. Oh. They tried all sorts of stuff. Wasn't working. Surgery, last option. They went in on the side. They broke my rib, deflated my lung, took it out and scraped all the junk off it, put it back in, blew it up. And I come when I was coming to, the doctor said to me, you're right. We didn't find any cancer. And I thought, Who do, who's talking about cancer? Was that something in the playbook? He goes, well, we couldn't get a biopsy. We didn't know what we were going to find. So oh that scared the hell out of me. Lord. My sister tried with lung cancer. And again, she didn't smoke either. So very strange stuff. So I got, I said, let me get the vax. I got two little nieces that are two and one. My, my sister and her husband are in the late seventies. I fly in to see him. And I got it three times since then, but all mild, all like, you know, aches and pains, sore throat, three, four days and you're done. Not the worst. Um, but I, I don't think, look, I'm very against the vax. I feel like it's helped me, not wood. But I really feel differently inside my body now. I just absolutely do. I have like, sometimes I'll hit my shin on a, I don't know, a gate or something. One cut took so long to heal. It was like a war wound. Like I, just, I bumped into the gate. What is, what's going on in my body? Everything, I don't feel the same. I've said this on my show. I, I, don't, I, I think, I don't want to say I know. I'm fairly certain in my own heart that they put stuff in there that doesn't make us feel right. Something's off. Um, yeah, but at the same time, AJ, you could be having long haul COVID. I that could be doing too. this, you know. I know, I know. I don't, I don't regret that I got it, but I just feel like getting getting something the government tells you you have to get. I don't trust that, and I always knew like the mask rule was baloney and the six foot was baloney. I would say, mm-hmm. why are we all becoming sheep? Why are we listening to this nonsense? Six feet in a restaurant, you can walk in the restaurant with your mask on, sit down, take it off, put it on between bites. It's such baloney. The person next to you in a plane is eating peanuts. He can take it off. I'm drinking. We're eight feet, eight inches apart. It, it, none of it makes sense. I know what I'm being lied to. And it turned out a lot of what they said was lies. A lot of it was like, let's throw this ball, see if they believe it. But I can't find out. I think it's locked up for 75 years. I think there's well, no Well, you know, on the other hand, though, AJ, I did everything by the book and then some. And poo poo, I've not had it. COVID. I've oh, never good, had good. COVID. What are yeah. you doing? You taking? I'm taking all sorts of. I did. Stuff. I did all the vaccines and all the boosters, and I yeah. did, and I wore the mask everywhere, I mask. and I yeah, didn't I go anywhere, and I played it really COVID crazy, and, and I didn't never, get sick. You didn't get it. Okay. No. Well, I didn't get it. That's great. I mean, I was traveling a lot, and. Uh, I attribute it to airports and hotels and restaurants and airports and airplanes. Who knows? You go to go drive yourself crazy to try to figure it out. You um, can't figure it out. But, you know, now I've started to travel and have gone to Europe and, and I just came back from Portland and now I'm doing everything. And I, the first time, the first time I went out in the world without masks, um, <laughs> I got so sick. I didn't get COVID but I got the worst cold I've had in five years, you know, because because your system, you weren't allowing your system to work for so long. Absolutely. And so I got incredibly sick, but, but, but not COVID, but now I've started to travel again, but I'm the only one in the airport wearing the mask on the plane, wearing the mask. Yeah. I'm still doing it. I'm not 
I don't I don't put people down for it. I think it's a little crazy to wear it in your car when you're alone. Yes, I do too. But, but you know, <laughs> uh, but look, if it makes you feel better and you haven't gotten it yet, then don't change a thing. Keep well, doing what you're doing. Yeah, well, I there mean, you go. All right. Well, so yeah. let's get off the, the the COVID stuff and let's get let's get back to AJ. So a lot of uh, people that are here with us now were not with us last time that you right. were on the show. So AJ, tell everybody, you know, you you've had such you've you've lived the life. You you and I have a lot in common in that we both love celebrity. We have yeah. no we you know, I I have no um I'm not embarrassed about that at all. No. I, I love the people that I love, right? I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Okay, so how how did this bug <laughs> get in you to begin with? Where did this start for you? I really think, well, my father and mother are big readers. We always get the paper on Sunday and I'd get this section, they get that section. My mother had a habit of reading Ronan Barrett. Mm -hmm. Ronan Barrett. Oh, oh yeah, sure, of course. And she'd read Liz Smith and... My mm -hmm. mother would always say, you know what your friend said about Cher? She was my friend, Ma. Liz Smith, your friend. Like, this is when I was like nine or 10. I didn't know nothing about it. I said, who's Liz Smith? You, Rita. And she loved the movie, movie stuff stuff. She'd read it out loud. And I got to like it. And of course, my father took me to every movie. I don't care if I was seven years old. I was in R-rated movies, foreign films. So me. I mean, I'm watching a French Connection, Les Tangle, not not Les Tangle, that's too much, but everything, Godfather. I went to everything as a kid. I fell in love with movie stars. And once I started meeting them, once I started meeting them, and I had the job of a New York City gossip columnist, mm -hmm. it was a perfect marriage of me being able to see my, my the celebrities I admired, be at all the parties, all the opening nights, every play opening, every light club and lounge, Velvet ropes up in the air. It was a great, great time. I think, I think it was the last time we're going to see that. The, the New York City has certainly changed. I don't. I LA mean, has too. LA yeah, too. It's all changed, of course. It's just a whole different world now. And I remember there was nothing better in the whole world than having my job. And I, you know, Vicky, in the mid early nineties, I don't think there were more than twenty gossip columnists in America, because outside of LA, New York, LA had like one. I'm trying to think who the others were outside of New York and LA. I don't know any of the city that a gossip column. I just don't. So we were like the real people who, who steered the engine of Hollywood gossip. Liz Smith, Richard Johnson, me, Cindy Adams, Jeanette Wall, so, so many of us. Um, it was a very exclusive club. I felt very special about it. And then I got the bug to be on television. And I liked the way the camera looked. I loved an audience looking at me, very narcissistic, but I had those dreams as a kid. I want to be an actor. I want to be on TV. I didn't know how I was going to do it. I literally would say, my in-laws would say, well, you got to go out for that. You can't. Do I said, no, they're going to come to me. How going to come to me? <laughs> I, I, I know. And then one day I'm at E, I'm at uh, the Daily News and I get a call from a producer at E saying, look, this is, you know, this is a, it's, Look, it's just an idea, but I think we're gonna have, we have a TV show for you. And he explained the show, Mysteries and Scandals, that he created. Old stars, there's scandals. You're walking around with a suit in LA, like film noirish and smoke and blue lights in the street. You're in a nice suit. I said, I, I, I love it. We have to make a sizzle reel. So I flew out there on my own dime. We made a sizzle reel. We sold, well, he sold 13 episodes. Then it turned into 172 episodes. So for wow. five years, it was a great run. Um, it's so ripe to do again because there's so many celebrities that have had scandals in the last 20 some years since I'm off the air, but uh, that's not what E's business is. He, he doesn't do that kind of program anymore. So it'd have to be somebody else. I, I wish there'd be a day where they bring it back. I think they'd, they'd be foolish not to. I think the nostalgia of it, there's so many more scandalous shows to talk. We didn't even cover Liz, Liz Taylor, Marlon Brando, Michael Jackson. I mean, there's so many big stars that died since the 90s, uh, since 2000. That okay, so somebody, uh, Mickey asked about Michael Jackson. So tell, okay. give us your take on Michael Jackson. Well, that, we, we broke that, that was my, my column. Me, Linda Stacy, and Michael Lewis broke that story. We had a, an old publicist named Bernie Bennett, an old Jewish guy, Natalie Tress guy, <laughs> really sweetheart. He had like a couple of restaurants in New York and mm -hmm. you know, just like little business. But he had uh, an ear to a woman who talked to his wife, Long story short, Bernie had an in with Jordan Chandler, the first kid who was abused. He had an in somehow to that kid's mother. 
in a game of like telephone. She'd tell her friend, his friend would tell his wife, his wife would tell him. And Bernie started thinking, this could be a big story. He called us with it. Would you like that story? I said, don't tell anyone this story. We'll meet you at a restaurant right now. It's our story. We ran to some seafood restaurant by 42nd Street and um, he gave us everything. And we didn't even know, like we put the kid's name in the paper, Jordan Chandler, once, then him never won it again. But all that came from us. We discovered everything. So that was our story, got a lot of heat for it. Um, <clears throat> and at the time, um, I was going to LA a lot and I happened to be dating at the time, uh, Jermaine Jackson's ex-wife, right? Okay. She, I was so nervous because if Michael knew that I was with her, he would he would like no more pay for the kid's school and pay for her rent because Michael paid for everybody. So right. she had to kind of like tell me I can't be around you. So I, one of the first times I really thought, wow, this is like a big this is a big deal. And you know, I'll always think he did it. I know he has uh, an army of millions out there who think we're all crazy and he's an innocent guy. But listen, man, I grew up with two young nephews, and if one of them was in an, an older man's room and sleeping in his bed with a door with six locks on it. I'd be in there with a baseball bat. What do you think's happening in there? Sharing beds with kids. It's crazy stuff. So, and, and back then, Latoya Jackson, who I know Latoya is looked on as the crazy one, but she had a husband named Jack Gordon back then. Mm -hmm. and Jack I remember to, Jack Gordon. Remember Jack? Yeah, mm -hmm. right. yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he used to call me a lot and he put Latoya on the phone a few times and Latoya saw me writing about Michael Jackson, and she say, AJ, you're the only one with the guts to tell the truth. I know for a fact my brother's a pedophile. My mother told me he is. I've seen things. I've seen things. And oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, she didn't hold back. So I thought, well, I think we got this handle. And then, of course, I felt awful because I was a huge Michael Jackson fan. I still love his music. But can you separate the artist from the man? I think I've done that. I'll still listen to his music. But he did some really questionable, if not awful things. AJ, is there any story that you didn't break because oh, of your oh. feelings for the person? Oh boy, there was a, there, there's been stories that have come across my desk or across my phone mm -hmm. where it, it was gonna affect a, a man I knew or a woman I knew. And rather than break it, I would call them and warn them that it's out there. And then uh, what they do after that is up to them. That happened with Sylvester Stallone. It was a situation before he was, just as he got with Jennifer Flavin, it was a situation with another girl. He, I went down to Miami, met with him in his house. We had a plan. You know, a lot of people, sometimes I think of myself as the Ray Donovan of Gossip Columnist <laughs> because I would have to get guys out of trouble sometimes. Then they'd owe me a favor. It's always good to have a favor, hello to you. And, you know, 10 years after that thing with Sly, he puts me in Rocky Balboa. Now, I like to think I was good enough with my audition, but still, who knows? I don't know. Fixed his fixed his mess up. But yeah, that's happened before. I It even, ha it even happened with Harvey Weinstein. I remember <clears throat> I was going to pay for, I got a painting for him called Harvey Wood instead of Hollywood because mm -hmm. he had done me really well with my book deal and such. I went to go pay for the painting and the girl in the art gallery goes, who's this for? I said, my friend Harvey Weinstein. She goes, oh, he's dating my friend in London. Now, at the time, Harvey's married in Connecticut with a wife and kids. I know that. I'm like, okay. So I call him. I said, why does a girl who works in an art studio know you're banging somebody in London? It's not true. It's not true. Ten minutes later, he calls me back. Okay, it's true. What do we do? And I said to him, okay, well, I will. I was out of gossip by then. I was living in L.A., no more gossip anymore. I said, I'm still down the the ground. I'll give your PR staff a bunch of great stories every week. And I broke stories like Roger Clemens on steroids, another Michael Jackson story. I was getting good stuff. And I said, if any reporter calls your staff and says, we got this information about Harvey dating a woman in London, they'll be able to steer them off of that story by giving them something good that I gave to your team. So that's, he paid me money for that, did that for a year because he was merging with Disney. It was a bad scene if he got caught. He ended up marrying the girl in uh, the, the the English girl. That's the girl he was with when all this shit hit the fan. So I told him that story. We worked at a deal where I could keep him covered for a year and he paid me. And, you know, that's a lot of, a lot of things are like that. Not money wise, but a lot of it is quid pro quo. You know, if you got something on my friend that can bury him, don't do that story. Here's a bigger one, you know, but, and then, you know, a lot of journalists will say, okay, I get it. I get it. You know, it's good to have a friend 
at, that says, hey, can we do something else with this story? I got a bigger one for you. It's just a lot of negotiating. You know, you got to bring that to the table. So why would people tell you things, AJ? So, so you go into- I'm just a good, I'm a good listener. I, I knew, I, I figured out how to do it pretty early on. I mean, I was a sports writer, so I was always good at questions. And I know people's, I just can tell, I, don't know, I, I have, I have this in, intuition, uh, but I knew that if I just let them talk enough and hang out with them late enough, I've seen it happen a million times. People tend to say things they shouldn't say or didn't think they'd say, but you got to hang out with them a long time and be like the wallpaper. Don't stand out. And I always had this rule, and I still think it applies in life. I would always ask why three times. Another one of my rules was after you ask the question to somebody, don't say a word because the next person who speaks loses. I learned that in sales. Wait, you explain quote, that. Explain that. Well, if, you, if I'm going to sell you a boat for $40,000 and I go, it has this and this, it's $40,000, but I think you're really going to love it. If I keep going on, now the way to get someone in is to go, boat's $40,000. And I say nothing. You're going to want to speak because I spoke last. It's very psychological. And right. when you do, I got you. And then I start to ask why three different times, not the boat, but a different story, a, a, a gossip story. I just would say why three times. And I found out that why three times people tend to break down and tell you the whole story. I, Cause I think people like to tell secrets. It's just in our nature. It's uh, it's there's little trivial things. They love to get off their chest. And it, people have this innate desire to be the one that told the story. So if you're talking to the guy that writes the stories, and you're the person who told the story the first time, you get high and I get paid. It's a very symbiotic relationship. And it comes from everybody. Somebody knows something out there. You just gotta hang around long enough, get about 500 sources over the years. And if something breaks, you go, I know who to call for that. I know who to call for that. And you start, you, you start the business of calling people. And, and eventually you get to the nugget. Um, but yeah, I, I, but when I left Gossip, I was, I was definitely tired of it. It got to be, um, you know, sometimes you want to take a shower at the end of the day. It's so much, a lot of grimy stuff you hear. And should I print this? Should I print that? And it was such a fast paced job. I would have like a minute to talk to somebody, a minute. I had, I have tapes of myself answering my phones. I wanted to hear the way I sounded years later. I don't even know what I was saying. I was such a blur because I had no time. Hey, you got a minute? I got less than a minute. Go, 30 seconds, go. And it was like that all so day So people are calling. They know you're looking for the story. So you don't even at a certain point have to go out and get the story. They're coming to you. Is that well, what's I happening? Go, I, I would stay out late and I'd see things. I'd see things or I'd hear things. So I knew right. what I could bring to the next day's paper. But I knew if I was short, I could answer some phone calls. Or I just picked the phone and called some publicists and go, what do you got? Anything good? A lot of these publicists were young girls in their 20s who not only represent Naomi Campbell, but represent a shoe store in Soho. They represent a little boutique here or a restaurant in Westchester. They have all these accounts. So right. if, you can, if you can write about their stupid restaurant in Westchester, uh... you just mention that, mention Governor Pataki was in Westchester's blah, blah, blah. The restaurant owner's happy because he pays 10 grand a month for press. The girl's happy. And then I'm happy because she gives me a story about Naomi Campbell, which is what I wanted in the first place. Uh, so she's able to get her side hustle done and if Naomi gets mad she just act clueless I have no idea I have, I have no idea so many stories we got I got were from people who are employed by the people wow yeah, it's really it, managers agents publicists wow yeah. so they're double crossing their clients basically you have to know everybody yeah they are they do they do yeah it's a shame but a lot of a lot of uh Hollywood people know that they've been down the road before they know it but what can you do I mean uh, Unless you and so they're not making money for it, but they're getting their side hustles or their small, well, their lesser clients. But they're making money so, on the lesser clients. They're making they're making the big money on Naomi Campbell or Sly Stallone, but they'll make a little check on the restaurant or the boutique, not the ten or fifteen grand Naomi and Sly pay a month, because that goes to the PR company and the rep gets a slice of that. But if they're repping a little place on the outside of town that no one's going to really hear about, that guy will still pay them because he got them. They got them in a paper. And for a while, my column was very hot, uh, along with page six. And I was young. Me and Richard Johnson were the only straight white men to do gossip. Maybe mm -hmm. two others, George Rush and Frank, uh, uh, I forget his last name. 
but they were like those were upper crust guys, Columbia School of Journalism guys. Richard Johnson grew up rich. I was a kid from the streets, an Italian. Let's, from the so streets. let's talk about that. Let's talk about where you come from and how you got there. Just uh, born in Brooklyn and um, mm -hmm. moved to Long Island when I, when I was a kid. I grew up on the on the Bay in Suffolk County. Um, and what know, did you want to be when you were a kid, AJ? And did you I, want to be an actor? I, I of course I entertained that. But one day in eleventh uh, grade, we had the creative writing course. We had to write a story, and I wrote this. I don't know, this crazy the story about uh, a little boy hitting a home run for his grandfather in stickball as his grandfather was dying in the hospital. And um, I read it out loud, and about three girls were crying. And I said, <laughs> oh, man, I'm going to be a writer. I like the way this looks. This feels good. They're all touching me on the way out. That was so beautiful. And I thought, this is amazing. This is no different than a guy dealing drugs. You know, if guys didn't, they, they wouldn't, they wouldn't. Girls wouldn't be with a guy dealing drugs if he didn't make a lot of money doing it. So I thought, Oh, writing is, I could write, I think I could write. And I did, I did love writing, I love reading. So then I went to college, got my degree. I knew I wasn't gonna go to some other city and work on their paper for 24,000 a year. I worked a cash job in Long Island, a gambling job where I met, I worked with John Gotti for a while in the eighties and just a wild life. And then I got my job as a sports writer at Newsday on Long Island. And then that just turned into up, 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 the daily news and, you know, we did it for did it for eight years or so, and then uh, TV. How did you, how did you segue to to gossip? I was out one night, uh, Vogue anniversary, Vogue magazine's hundredth birthday party at a, at a big museum, and I had nothing to go. I had no invitation. I'm trying to get in. As I'm trying to get in, Mickey Rourke's being thrown out, and him and I just had eye contact. I always loved Mickey Rourke. I have his the name Pope on my arm because of his movie Pope. My my nickname's Pope of that movie i saw him he saw me and i don't want to sound like a, this is some kind of romance but something happened we just kept staring at each other and he says what happened to you i said i can't get it i don't have an invitation he goes let's go downtown to a little club called rex he said everybody here is going to be there an hour and a half we jump in his town car his friend drove us downtown he loved my earring. I gave him my earring. I liked his vest. He gave me his vest. It was like very gay in the backseat. Very a bromance. It was. Yeah. Mickey, Mickey, had, Mickey, yeah, it was a bit. Mickey has that thing about him. Like, you know, you gotta, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't doubt it if he had a man, put it that way. So, um, yeah, we're at the club and all of a sudden, Cindy Crawford walks in, Naomi walks in, Rod Stewart walks in. You go, oh my God, I never saw this kind of stuff. And now I'm watching Cindy Crawford make out with another female model because they felt very like in their element. No gossip right. comments were in there, but I'm with Mickey, so I must be cool. Right. Know me. And I called, the next day I called Linda Stacy, who was uh, writing the gossip column for in, uh, for New York Newsday, Manhattan. And I said, look, um, I always wrote a column, very funny, great writer. And I said, Linda, I got some items to you that I was out last night. I saw Cindy making out with a model. Really? So she goes, and she was at that age where she didn't want to go out anymore. She was an older woman, not old. Wait, how did, you, how did you know Stacy? Because you, I, you were I writing Long, another column. I worked at Long Island Newsday. She worked at New York Newsday in the city. Right. But I read her column every day. So I didn't know her, know her, never met her. But I sent her a message. She goes, how would you like to go out every night for me and get me items? I'll pay you 50 bucks an item. I said, yeah. I just was divorced. It was 1991. Started going to the city. Knew nobody. I mean, I must have ran to you at China Club, I'm sure. That's how Absolutely. I met. Absolutely. <laughs> and I started doing China Club Mondays and all the different nights of the week. Couldn't stop me. I was single. I was having a ball. <laughs> and then um, the Mort Zuckerman, the famous publisher, decides to buy the Daily News. And he had a he had a thing for Linda. He wanted her there badly. So he said she had a meeting. He wants to take her to do to, to, to the Daily News, leave Newsday. And she said, if I go, I want to bring my guy, which was me. And another guy, this guy who was gay named Doug Vaughn, who uh, was coming, really sardonic wit, southern, that sticks from down south, gay guy. So we had a all covered. Woman, tough guy, gay guy. We go to Human Resources for the first meeting at the Daily News, and in the middle of the meeting, Doug Vaughn looks at me and says, I can't do this anymore. I said, what, the meeting? He says, no, I can't do gossip anymore. I'm done. First day. So now it's just me and Linda. Doug went on to produce the morning show that he did very well on television. He made a fortune on TV. But now it's just me and her. And then after about a year, we brought in Michael Lewis, who worked for a public uh, PR firm. He went to Yale. I went to jail. Then there was a tough <laughs> chick. You know, we had we had a good round. Michael would go uptown. Uh, you know, Elaine's. I would be in Soho in the Village. We had it covered. Linda had calls from big executives like Donald Trump and people like that who love to give her information. 
So our, our column is so wide ranging. And, um, you know, that's how I got in there. And then eventually Linda retired, left the column. So it was mine now. Happened so fast that I just took it and ran. And I thought when my, my hero, Pete Hamill, the great writer, became the editor in chief, I thought, well, this is going to be great. He's my idol. He was a womanizer, a fist fighter, a drinker. We're going to get along crazy. Turns out he stopped womanizing. He's married. Doesn't drink anymore. You know, just completely turned over a new leaf and he hated gossip. So he, he, after like a year, it was the word came down that Pete's going to let you go. He, he, he'll let you resign or take another job with the paper, but no more gossip. I said, I don't want to do anything else. I don't want to write. No. He gave me some ideas. I shot him down. So I left. But then I went to work for E. TV came right away and they gave me another show. The other networks got okay. So now wait, when you get TV, AJ, this is kind of the merging. And I want you to tell the story of how you um, auditioned for acting class. But so when you're now merging your writing with your dream to become an actor, is this like the best of both worlds? Are you like, okay, this is it. I'm here. This is it. I I thought the phone would never stop ringing. You couldn't tell me nothing. I'm out every night, Mm -hmm. every night. I mean, just like New York, but LA now I'm in Hollywood every night with you know so many great people and celebrities yeah I was I was never hired in my life both literally and figuratively because that's when when I lost all the jobs and the phone stopped ringing then I reached for the drugs and alcohol to you know kind of make me feel better terrible idea Mm. but you know I regrouped and found myself again but um yeah it's a tough town tough town when you're not working but when I was working you couldn't tell me nothing I had a ball I had a ball. And that's why so many, so much of my shows have just these stories about mm-hmm. me at night with a guy or a girl and or Colin Farrell or who know any story. I have so many of them that sometimes they just, oh, I forgot to tell the story. The next day I'll tell the story. Or if the guy's in the news, I can peel off him being in the news for some reason and go into my story. So I just try to stay awake and alive about what's happening. But Hollywood was great. But I did find it very phony. You know, it is very phony. It, it, you have to be a certain person to to stay in that in that uh, world. And um, it, I got to a point where I couldn't stand it. The money's great when you hit. When the phone doesn't ring, it's awful. It's an awful feeling. And then you find yourself doing things you never thought you'd do for money. You know, reality shows. I remember they offered me, when I was hot, they offered me the first season of uh, Dancing with the Stars. And I said to my manager, I'm not doing this. He goes, no, this is a piece of shit. You can't do it. You'll, you'll, you'll have no career. I said, yeah, who's going to do the show? It used to be looked down on. Like, you're going to do that? No. Now it's become, or it did become, the place, the thing to do to resuscitate your career and get big Absolutely. again. It was not like that when they offered it to me. They offered me a singing show, all this kind of stuff. And I did a couple of uh, reality shows because I needed the money. You, know, you, did, you did one to lose weight or something, yeah, right? I did a celebrity fit camp for VH1. But, you know, they, they throw like, here, how, is $90,000 enough for eight weeks work? And you go, yeah, to run around the <laughs> Sure. Let's go. Let's start tomorrow. So they get you with the money, and then you go, oh, this is forever. But, you know, I, nowadays people have such a short memory that what you did 25 years ago just doesn't stay in their mind anymore. That every eight seconds they're finding something else to look at and read but I get a kick out of my kids are now old enough to, you know, they see things, you know, know, the teacher will say they didn't really know who I was because they weren't born when I was on TV. And uh, they did see me on TV several years ago with a different show, but sometimes they go to school and the teacher will go, is your your father that AJ Benza? And they're like, yeah, that's, he's AJ Benza. And they were like, dad, why did my teacher say that? Because I did a lot of things in the nineties and 2000. I did a lot of work on TV. Oh, but kids really don't care. You can show them something you're right. so proud of, and they'll just walk away from it. Like, what? The, what do you? This is really walk away. It's good. It's a good grounding lesson. They just don't care. They want you to be daddy. So, um, but now they're starting to Google me, and they—I mean, they've done it in the past. And I'm very open and very honest. And you know, I'm sure they've read things that don't make them happy or thrilled. But then again, I tell them, your father did everything stupid, so you never will. You know, that's ah. it. Right. I had this one set the statement I made for them when things were bad, like when things go bad and money's low and the jobs aren't coming in, I'd say to them, God gave me gray skies so yours could be blue. Remember that. And um, they were young, they didn't wow. get it. But I still like that I said that. It, you know, that's all you're living for is your kids at some point. 
You know, I go, I do a poker show now in Vegas called High Stakes Poker. It's been okay. So poker. Gabe Kaplan, we, um, he, he my ex-husband Gabe Abelson lived with Gabe Kaplan and wrote oh, for him, which is I great. Know that. Oh, you wow. have to tell Gabe hello. I will. Well, you know, he um, he retired. He left the show. He retired mm -hmm. last season. So I'm working. I'm doing with a younger guy. Oh, named, he's not doing it anymore. No, he he turned eighty, and he said, "You know what? Wow. There's so many young poker players. I don't know these guys. I didn't grow up with these guys." Gabe knows all the old timers who play. Right. Play. And that's all Gabe does is play poker. He lives in Houston mm -hmm. and plays poker all mm -hmm. night, every day. Mm -hmm. And um, he goes, I don't know these guys. They're too young. So he begrudgingly said, I think I should walk away from the show. You got AJ, you got a younger guy next to AJ, another expert. And uh, you do a different coordination of the show. So he left. But wait a minute. Now, isn't it true that when you started doing the show, you didn't know anything about poker? I I, I <laughs> didn't know another thing. I, they actually, there was, there was a thing that went out that the uh, high stakes poker is looking for an AJ Benz a type. I remember reading that. And I said to my manager, <laughs> if I don't get this, I'm going to go back to Long Island and shop bait on a party boat. This is <laughs> disgusting. So I get the meeting. They assume I played poker because of my, the way I act, I'm a street guy, whatever. Right. Let's go to the, the casino and let's go look at some poker. After like an hour, they go, you don't play, do you? I said, no, not at all. Never played <laughs> once in my life. But now, but I had, I had the job because me and Gabe had a, had a way to talk together. We liked each other right away. So uh, then we came up with, all right, look, AJ's not going to be an expert. Gabe's the expert, obviously. But AJ's going to be the guy that asks the questions that every man at home asks or the every man at home asks. Like, why is it called a belly buster? You know, how many out? How, how do you figure out how many outs a player has? How does your mind work that way? So I became the guy who's sitting at home who doesn't understand every single thing about poker, but is intrigued enough to watch it. Right. And over the years, it's been 10 years now. And I, over the years, wow. I've learned a lot more about it, but I still don't really get all of it, how fast they are. They're, they have these math brains with these large sums of money, $500,000 on a hand. Wow. It's unbelievable. And then, you know, it's on the internet. People look at it on YouTube for 30, 40 million views. There's such a, a poker community out there that's just all about poker. So I'm going back to Vegas in late July to do another season. And um, yeah, I hope that keeps going. It's a great, great side job. I love it. And so do you play now? No, no. never played a game in my life. Oh. I used to dread, I used to dread going in because they knew so much. I didn't know, I would sweat. I remember <laughs> one time I left midday to have lunch. I wanted to have a shot around the corner. My hands were like this. That's how nervous I was to do the show. I said, what am I doing this for? But the pay was really good. And I just calm down. And then we got each other and we figured out the relationship and then it became easy. I know I can, I can I'm allowed to be clueless and a little stupid. <laughs> That's good. The you only know, poker I ever played with Gabe Kaplan was we played liars poker. Do you know liars poker? Yeah, on the, sure, on, yeah. Sure. I played, he beat me at that. Oh, he's great. He's, you know, he also, he, he also found like a kindred spirit in me because it welcome back. Cotta was, was shot in the high school. I lived across the street from in Brooklyn Get it's out really of here. Cool. No, it's really called New Utrecht High School, but they called it Buchanan. And in the beginning of the show, when they sing Welcome Back, they showed the school and our apartment building that we were right across the street from it. Wow. And I go, this is too much. I would have been, a, I bet I would have been a uh, sweat hog if I went to Buchanan. <laughs> but it just, being on TV with him, not only that, but then having to have, having to know my timing of when to speak, because he's such a great comedian. But we had all these references about, he knows I love old movies. And so he could mention Roger Crawford or some old actor. And he loves that I understand who that person is, what movies they made. But the younger, the new guy now, we're off that. Now him and I have our own banter. It's not about old movies or old, it's a new thing. So I'm like, I'm like the guy I'm dancing with these two men who were very good at what they do. And I'm trying to, I just have to figure out what I can cut in, when I can cut in and say something. Um, for a couple of years we did during COVID, it was both of us together, but when COVID hit, I was alone, the studio was here, and Gabe was in the third room alone, so there was, there was windows we could see each other, but not right next to each other, which is hard to do a show when you're going to, I'm watching, Absolutely. if his mouth's going to move, you know, it was a little more, a little more uh, work, but um, yeah, it's all working out fine. Uh, now I love going to work, I love that job, it just goes to show, I was petrified of it, and now I, I want to, I want to thought tomorrow, you know? I love that. Uh, let's talk about your book for a second. The last time that I, I saw you, 
74 and Sunny was optioned. You yeah. were writing about to write a screenplay. What's going on with that? I wrote I wrote the screenplay. I got paid. Uh, now the man who, who well, my producing partner, um, well, COVID, COVID messed with a lot of things. He had two projects in Netflix that got held. He's a great writer. Um, and now he's putting together a film about the 1984 boxing team on the Olympics. It's a great story. But the, but the point is this. These things take years. I mean, it's very, mm -hmm. very odd for a script to be made, written, and get picked up and financed and shot. It takes a long time. So I'm at that point now where I want to start nudging him and seeing what, what, he's, what he's doing next. But I knew enough in the beginning, like just especially with COVID hitting, you, nothing was getting done for a while there. And now mm -hmm. there's so many different more avenues. There's so many more streaming platforms that weren't around when I first wrote the book. There was no Hulu. There was no anything plus. So mm -hmm. you know, a lot's changed. A lot's changed. So I, it's a great book. And if I may say so myself, and the screenplay is really fun and interesting. And, you know, in case people don't know, it's about my uh, summer that um, my father had a brother. And that brother had two gay sons. And when the second son, the younger son, was showing signs of that, he called my father one night and asked him if he could watch the boy. It was 10. Watch him for the summer to make a man out of him. Because back then, the old men thought, you could make a man out of him. He's not going to be gay, you know. So we took him fishing and sports and did our best to make him. He was still, still, still singing show tunes in, in the shower. You know, it didn't work. Mm -hmm. And that's when my father knew this is not something we can change. We have to adapt to him. And um, it was big of my father to do that because back then, a lot of men didn't see homosexuality as anything but a threat and a weird thing and a curse. And what's right. wrong with you? But he really showed a lot by being gentle about it and keeping my net my my cousin loved and calm. And so it was a big learning experience for all of us. Um, mm -hmm. But 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 the story is funny because all the stuff that happens, you know, there was a time where you thought you could talk a kid into not being gay. Or throw some sports at him. He'll find his manhood. It was so different back then, you know. In yes. fact, I was watching yes. a movie. I was watching a movie today from 1979, Greased Lightning with Richard Pryor. And the N-word was said by white people in that movie about 50 times. And I thought, what? oh my. Yeah. I, they just, they said it constantly. And I thought, oh my God, how do we let this go? I feel like 1980 was not that long ago. I mean, it's 40 years, but horrible. So. You know, we become a better country every day. Just we're grinding it out. And uh, all these new folks and people we have to recognize and bring them in the fold. And it, it's a lot of growing pains for a lot of people. Do you think you have another book in you? Are, are you writing another yeah. book? Do you have another yeah, book? I'm writing, I'm writing another book. I, I pick it up and put it down. I'm not like physically doing it every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to tell. I, I really never told my L.A. stories. I've told my New York stories in my first book, Fame Ain't a Bitch. Mm hmm but I have so many great stories in LA that, that I went through that I want to tell those stories. A lot of my podcasters of my audience has heard those stories and by me saying them, but I've got a lot of great stories about hanging out with movie stars and, you know, seeing, seeing Sinatra sing for the last time in his life for a crowd and after his birthday at the shrine in a little piano room with the four seasons <clears throat> going out, hanging out with Winona Ryder after her, after her theft charges were, uh, were, were kind of blown down wild stuff wild um so i'm putting those stories together now uh i've got like four chapters done i'm taking my time you know why i do people even read books anymore i don't even know i love a good book but are they really reading books again all i know is it's a lot of work and the payoff is really <laughs> pay a shit pay a shit i mean you got <laughs> you got fifty thousand if you're lucky for an advance and if you sell 10 12 000 copies it's kind of okay you sell 50 it's a bestseller I never sold 50,000 copies, apparently, but it's like, I don't think there's, a, there's an audience for a book, like a book audience anymore. Everybody's on their phones and scroll. I scroll all day. Mm -hmm. I have three books in my suitcase I haven't touched yet. I took them from the airport. I still haven't read them. So is it's, that the audience? It's, it's embarrassing and it's horrible, but I have two books on my nightstand that I have barely cracked yeah. and I'm on no. my phone, but I read on my phone all day Me long. Me too. But I read all day. I read books on Kindle, but there's something about the smell no. of a book. There's something no, about I don't read books on Kindle. I read crap. I read articles. Oh, I me read... too. Yeah. Me too. I look yeah, for yeah. stuff all day, but I have a few on Kindle when I'm on the airplane, but it's not the same thing. I no. like to feel paper, like newspapers. Me too. Love that feeling, getting your fingers dirty from the paper. It's over. It's over. It's, it's a shame, but we move on to this crap now. 
Um, yeah, it's not good for this. This was a big reason why the eyes thought to go. I think just always looking at this, always looking at this stupid thing. Are yeah, you, st- you are it. you st- are you writing columns? I haven't written oh. a column in a long no. time. No, I'm not writing anymore. No, I you know I when I when I do my show, I I kind of bullet point it out. Mm-hmm. But still, and sometimes I'll go longer than a bullet point if I want to really establish a point. Uh, my shows are about 15 pages long uh, every day, so one show is about 14 pages long of writing so i am writing every day i'm just not writing stories but i'm writing when i was told i don't speak about and something is so personal that i really craft them and i read them you i mean people probably know i'm reading but some might not know but i keep it in my own parlance and the way i the rhythm with which i speak right. and i make it mine and they, they they like it and sometimes i just have to do a show like that that's personal or a little a little sad about a dog dying then i like to really have it done and 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 just perfect the way I want it. So and how much what, of the sh- how much of the show are will you do that? And then how much do you go off and just talk? I'll, I'll even say uh, in a parent in, in, in parentheses, you know, go off, fly here, just because I I'll, I'll remember. Oh, I can take that last paragraph and may tell that story that's about five minutes long. So I go in knowing I like forty minutes of material, and then not every, not everything's great. You know, if you get one or two points in there that people really dig, they respond to me. But um, I uh, I go off quite a bit. And, you know, it's funny. When I write something, I generally don't get in trouble. It's when I go off <laughs> script that I end up saying something stupid. <laughs> and my girlfriend will hear it. And why'd you say that? And I'll go, did I, what did I say? When did I say that? I said <laughs> that yesterday. I have no idea. No recollection. So then I'll go, all right. I just, I'm sorry. I, you know, I just want to ride. I'm, actually, my eyes will be closed. And I'm going on a ride. When I first did Adam Carolla's show, I didn't know he even knew me. I was very happy to hear he liked me and knew me. He would sometimes close his eyes in the middle of a sentence or a middle of, and just talk with his eyes closed. He'd be like this. So um, then I went and I said, is he like rude? How does he not look at me? And I said, no, that's him. He's got this, uh, uh, what's that called? That's something, Asperger's syndrome. I, you know, I was just going to say, I, I've really? met him at Phil Rosenthal's and I have... Yeah. I thought he had Asperger's. He does. He's brilliant, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. but he yeah. can't always make eye contact. And I go, okay, but now I'm doing it too. I don't have Asperger's, but I find if I close my eyes, it just gets the memories back. Really? I like to, yeah, I do it. And I like to, because um, I don't do a show where you can see me. A lot of my listeners want me to go to YouTube and I go, no, I, you know, I don't want to be seen anymore. You look great. I'm 61. I don't feel like I look like I want to look. And if I go on YouTube, I'm just a bigger target for people to cancel. Cause I see some crazy shit on my show. I really do. And I know, I, I know like if anybody's going to get hit, it's going to be me. So I'd rather not be on YouTube. I'm not going to make a lot of money from YouTube. Anyhow, it's stupid. I don't have that kind of audience where I can make a bunch of money on YouTube. No, that ship has sailed. So I like to be alone and just heard. There's something about, you know, a voice in someone's ear that I think is much more powerful than seeing the person. When I was a kid and I listened to Paul Harvey on radio or, or uh, so many radio people I love. Could be AM disc jockeys. Um, I just love the voice in the ear. Seeing is one thing, but the voice in the ear is better. I think it's more powerful. And it's also, you know, not that I'm on the market, but women lo- women fall in love with their ears. Uh, guys with their eyes. Women, it's the ears. So I have a lot of female listeners, probably more than men. I'm, I guarantee you more than men. And... Um, they love the show and they love the way it sounds. And I said, okay, I think that's the way to go. I like it like that. But I wouldn't mind doing what you're doing, but I just, I don't always look good. I, I, mean, I barely <laughs> shade for you, but like I have to shave every day and shit. I don't want to do that. I, it's, a, it's work. I got to put yeah. the makeup on. I got to come up with the shirt. I, yeah. I know, but, I know. but for me, you know, I was, I was a podcast, you know, mine was, I was a radio show at the beginning and then it right. went to a podcast and it was just hurt. And, and, and there, there, there is, a sexiness to that that I really like. Yeah. But for me, when I've talked about going back to that, I get a lot of I get a lot of pushback because for me, I'm so visual only because I'm I'm using my hands, I'm using my face, I'm yeah, you know, right. and also when I'm talking to someone else, there's something even even when we're on Zoom, there is an interaction that happens yeah. that's kind of fun to watch. It but is, I took, is, but I get good. it. It is good though, but you know, I think it's, I think it comes from being a kid and listening to your first transistor radio under the pillow, maybe, and mm-hmm. a baseball game is on late and your mother said, go to bed, but you put it under the pillow and listen to it. 
it's just something about the ears, man. It, 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 it hits you deeper, I think. It hits you deeper. I think maybe that I think I think that can be true for me. That late night thing was turning Johnny Carson on oh, yeah. with the with the contrast on really dark. And I oh, would really? just watch him and oh. I would watch him interact. You know, my mother didn't know I was watching, and you know, it was That's my sneak. Great. But I that yeah. that to me, that was what I always wanted to do. I wanted to be me too. him, right? Me yeah. too. I had they gave me I had a talk show for four weeks before they pulled the plug. <laughs> I loved it. They screwed up. I was way ahead of my time with things, but you know, I it, it hit me really bad. I got uh, it, it. It was tough to get over that. I thought I'd move back to New York, but it turns out where we shot the pot, where we shot the uh, talk show, mm -hmm. was right by the Twin Towers, not far from the Twin Towers. And um, the talk show was canceled in June, and in September the towers come down. So I'm not sure we would have to find a different lo location, and it would have been. Ah, who knows? You couldn't go down that part of the city for weeks. Oh, yeah. So maybe it'll happen for a reason. You know, I hate to think that way. Every, but everything does. But yeah, I know, I know, I know. But, so AJ, uh, before we go, I, and I know you're not feeling well, and I really appreciate so you rising I, 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 to the occasion. It's okay, no, no problem, no problem. I, but I, 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 I want. So I know you're not going to. You can't give us an exclusive because you've got your <laughs> your show to do that with. But can you can you give us some? Can you give us like a, some kind of current story that's going on? Something that you came across that, well, I'll like you, you mentioned. Something. Okay, go ahead. Uh, well, there's a big story that I uh, I broke. Um, there's been pushback, but I kind of expected it. But I found out from somebody that uh, I'll never reveal, but was in the room uh, in the hospital with Jamie Foxx, and um, I heard from this person that he'd gotten a blood clot. And apparently it happened not not much time after he got a booster that he didn't really want to get. Uh, in the hospital, he was partially blind and partially paralyzed. And that's why I started reading about him like we all did. And Jamie's responding, which I don't like that sound. That could be moving an eyelid. It could be mm -hmm. moving a finger, writing on a chalkboard. But responding isn't talking. And then they come out with these outlandish claims of him playing pickleball. And I said, enough is enough. And I got that story right around the time where the daughter was saying, he's fine. He's been home for weeks. He's not home for weeks. He's not fine. And I hate to say it because I love Jamie mm -hmm. Foxx. I think he's the most multi-talented actor in Hollywood, and maybe of all time. Singing, dancing, drama, comedy. Oh, he, he's phenomenal. Uh, but that's the last word I've got. And that was the end of May. His family shot back and said it's not true. His publicist is not true. But none of them are saying what's wrong. And I, don't know, I don't know about you, but, you know, all you got to do is pick your iPhone up and show your fans how you are. And I did it when I had pneumonia. I did Facebook Lives and sounding like shit, looking like shit, but I wanted my listeners to know. Whatever he's got, they don't want us to know. And wow. they picked a really weird way of explaining it to people. Um, I My story makes a lot more sense because Jamie Foxx would be... Look, when Jeremy Renner was squashed by that plow, oh. he, was, he was phone up in the next day filming himself. Yeah, he didn't feel good. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it, it, there's something going on, and I, I, I'd like to believe I'm right. I have a good source who told me that. Um, I hope I'm wrong in a lot of ways. I don't want to see Jamie suffer like that, you know. But that's the biggest one now, and that got picked up by Fox News, ESPN. Oh God, Charlie Kirk, Candace Owens, everybody ran with that story because I did it on Dr. Drew's show. It's got a good audience. And you know, speaking, I forgot about Dr. Drew. Dr. Drew was going to do my show. It was during COVID, and he had COVID, and he yeah. was so sick that he couldn't. I have to he reach back out to he, him. He, he, he does a lot. Of, he <laughs> had it really bad. He got, I think he picked it up in a hospital, uh, he said. I forget, but I did a show with him not long ago. I think that's where he got it. He was in and out of hospitals a lot during COVID. Uh, but, yeah, he had one of those long COVID situations that some people get. I can't imagine that. That's rough. We just talk about COVID and I start coughing. Okay, know, so so one more. You you talked about at the beginning, you meant you dropped something like I haven't told my stories about Michael Jackson, about Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton. What's your Elizabeth? Tell us an Elizabeth Taylor story. Well, you know, I'll, I'll say something that's not gossipy that I found very uh, interesting and endearing. I, uh, no, of course I was a fan of hers, but I never like a huge fan. I never like, to me, Liz Taylor in my lifetime was the lady who got heavy and sold perfume. You know, <laughs> with the big crazy hair. I know there's another Liz Taylor when I was younger and beautiful black hair beauty, of course. So there's that Liz Taylor, there's the 80s Liz Taylor and um, all the AIDS research, phenomenal stuff. Yes. 
and they used to imitate her choking on SNL. They had John Belushi playing her, you know, so they made mm-hmm. a mockery of her. But then I got to realize when I did Mysteries and Scandals of like, wow, you know, not one on her though, but I had like a reverence for her, what, what she made out of her life, you know, mm-hmm. and the, you know how her and Richard Burton would fly food in on a jet plane, on a private jet to have their favorite pasta from Italy. Crazy stories. Like, we don't even know what money is like that. But the big fights back and forth. What I love the most about her, uh, it's about me, so of course I'm going to like it. My produ- One of my producers was a very, uh, very flamboyant gay guy. He loved Liz Taylor, right? Like a lot of them do. He got to meet her. And when he told her what he did, he produces Mysteries and Scandals, she said, she grabbed his arm and said, that's my favorite show. She said, I love that guy in the street. AJ, what's his name? AJ, she goes, he goes, that was my idea. We wanted to fish out of water. He's in New York. Oh, I think he's great. She goes, you know why I love that show? And then she started to well up. She said, because I get to see all my old friends again. It just hit me really hard like that. So I never thought my show was that for somebody. Like, wow. Like, friend again. And then I later on, I met Milton Burrow. I used to hang out with red buttons of old people, going wow. to restaurants. And, and they told me the same thing. You know, like th- this is I I miss Errol Flynn. I miss so and so. I want to see her again. And there weren't a lot of those stories around because we picked on some celebrities that that many people don't even know, but they have great backstories. Great wow. backstories. But that was a cool thing to hear. Um, um, you you mentioned my first audition. Uh, I'll tell you what happened. It's funny. I I auditioned. Mm-hmm. I was studying acting in school in uh, college. My teacher said to me, look, you're good enough to go into the city. I have a coach that's great. Her name is Mira Rostova, old Russian woman, taught on the stage in, in Russia. I mean, acted on stage, the Seagull, Anton Chekhov. Now she's in New York City in a little apartment on 16th Street above Barney's. And she teaches acting. It was $10 a class for a four-hour show. That's all she got, a four-hour show class. She didn't want money. And that class had Jessica Lang, Alec Baldwin, Richard Kiley, Wow. Uh, I'm forgetting some people, but they would, Madonna would stop in once in a while. They'd all pop in for scene work. And one day, before I knew all that stuff happened, I'm with Mira and I'm going to deliver a, a, my monologue to see if she'll accept me. And I did the first one and she goes, Do you have anything else? I said, Shit, I didn't get it. So I said, Yeah, I got something else. Just then the door flies open. Carrie Fisher comes running in because she studied with Mira too. I didn't know that. This is young Star Wars Carrie Fisher. Right. She goes, oh, sorry. Is somebody here? Yeah, he's auditioning. And I said, I said, she can sit down. I'm like, that's Carrie Fisher. Jesus Christ. So she's sitting down with Mira and they're watching me. And then she goes, can I help him? Can I, can I be the other person in the play? And Mira said, sure, go ahead. So my first audition, I'm auditioning and Carrie Fisher helping me. And wow. she's phenomenal. And then at the end, Mira said, that was better. And Carrie said, Mira, you have to take him. He's great. You got to take him. And she took me. Wow. And Carrie and I, Carrie and I went and got a cup of coffee. Oh, she came to Mira to invite Mira to the Empire Strikes Back premiere. And Mira said, I don't like all that Star Wars stuff. I, and I right in front of Carrie Fisher, she said, Do you like it? And I didn't know what to say. I said, No, I really don't. I'm not a big fan of Star Wars. So we went and had coffee. <laughs> and I'd see her in LA. And she'd always remember that, you know, I saw I gave you a start. I told Mira to accept <laughs> you. And very wonderful, good person. I mean, crazy life but i found it very charming and uh so that was a crazy situation that's in my book um it gets a little deeper but yeah um uh, that was my okay first i have one more story i want you to to tell because yeah. sherry o'terry is a guest on the show next week oh, i'm her. having sherry and i i love her and i know you have a saturday night live story yeah she yeah, was there so yeah she was there i, I know that they, back in <laughs> yeah yeah exactly uh i think it was 2000 it was their 30th anniversary special and I get a word that they want me on the show in two sketches. They'll fly me out, you know, with my dog and my girlfriend at the time. And you're going to be in two sketches with Will Farrell, Jerry Seinfeld, all these big Chris Kattan, crazy. So I do the, I was with them for a week, right? Such a hectic place. We do the show before the show where they go live in front of the audience. And that's when then there's like an hour between the real show where they get rid of sketches, add on to sketches. It's you can't get in anybody's way. It's crazy. Right. Two sketches I'm in, they got caught. And I'm like, no, my family's in the audience. David Bowie's the music host. Jerry Seinfeld's the guest, uh, the hell host. And I'm like, this can't. I said, you guys. Are... So Sherry O'Terry and uh, Jimmy, um, what's his name? Jimmy Fallon. They come in. 
And they see my girlfriend was upset. I'm pissed off. I go, he flew me out of here. My whole family's out there. And I can't even go out there and tell him on the show. And Jimmy and Sherry said, oh, well, I will go talk to Lauren. And they come back 10 minutes later and they say, okay, Lauren's going to keep one sketch in. And um, it was just a silly sketch where all I had to do was come on and eat a piece of pizza and say, at the end of the sketch, fame, ain't it a bitch, and throw the pizza in the garbage. I don't know why they thought was funny, but I did that. And then the show ends, and Jerry Seinfeld, was one of the biggest moments of my life. Jerry Seinfeld says out loud, you know, when the band's playing, let's hear it for AJ Benza and, and David Bowie. And I go, that's never going to happen again, me and Bowie <laughs> together. And then Bowie goes and plays three different songs in a row for the crowd. Plays wow. going crazy. Rebel, Rebel. But he plays Fame. And I didn't know I had a show that was about fame yet. It wasn't there yet. And he just, oh, no, I'm sorry, no. Yeah, I was already on TV because after he got done playing, he said to me, you see, because Pitt Place was going bananas. He said, you see, fame isn't always a bitch. <laughs> I didn't know he knew about me or anything about me. So I'm trying to deal with, does he know my show? David friggin' Bowie? It was too much. So it was, and, but, but, but Sherry was there to help me and Jimmy Fallon was there to help me. And yeah, it was a great moment. They put me on Sopranos for a minute too, one episode. It was a really heady time for a while there in that, that early, not early 2000 era. Um, Dan Buffini liked me and he got me on the show. He didn't have me on the show as an actor, but they had my show on their TV when he was watching it with his sister. Right. He knew, he knew I'd read for the show and they said, you know, everybody knows you as Mysteries and Scandals guy. We can't, it's not going to work. We know you can play the part, but so he got me on. That was another thing. Jimmy, Jimmy Gallofini was that kind of guy. Really very, uh, just a big help to so many people. Very generous man. Didn't know his appetite for drugs was that big because he had a problem there for a while where the show would be shut down for days and no one will let that out. But Jimmy had a big appetite for everything, unfortunately. Uh, AJ, but, have uh, you ever had, you know, I, I'm an addict in recovery. I haven't used or drank in 21 years. Have you ever great. had, because you had to drink and use sure. and do all that stuff doing oh, yeah. your job. Have you, yeah. have you, have, have never, you hit walls no. with that stuff? Yeah. Yes, of course. I, I, I hit, hit, I hit a wall with alcohol uh, often enough that I'm not happy about it because, you know, my nephew dying, whenever there's a big thing in your life that you grieve over, of course, mm -hmm. there's a reason to grab a bottle of the, before you know, you have four drinks, five drinks. Now you sound sloppy. And my mm -hmm. listeners know, they let me know about it and they know, but um, no, I never went to rehab. Um, I've always been able to kick things and walk away and I've tried everything. Alcohol to me uh, is the last one to stop. And I'm, I didn't drink today, which is good, but um, my life's been really weird the last three years. It's been pretty hard. A lot of time spent alone, just my dog and I. And it's it's sometimes easy for me to slip into that person and grab a drink and sit down and write. And when I wrote my book, I was drinking a lot. Uh, and foolishly, I said to myself, I got to get my head into my father because I know my father's the linchpin of this book. And my father would come home every night and have two scotches after he was a salesman. And then he'd go to bed. So I, in, wanting to, in wanting to remember what he's like and what he, said, what, what he said to us, I foolishly thought, well, I can drink a couple of drinks. I'd have a couple of shots and a beer. And I'd get my father's words in my head. And my wife at the time didn't like it because she'd saw me changing while I was writing the book. But I thought, well, let me, let me go find him and, and, and the drink. It's stupid stuff. I mean, I, I did that when I wrote my book. So when I write screenplays, there's a time in life where you think the drug makes you more creative. Mm -hmm. And I can't say it doesn't because so many of our favorite artists were just messed up people on all sorts of stuff. <laughs> but I find it much more, uh, you're just much more dependable when you're not drinking or taking drugs. You know, forget drugs. Drug is over. I can't do that shit anymore. Um, but a drink now and then, yeah, except when one becomes six. That's mm -hmm. bad, you know? So that's the last thing I had to deal with. Um, and I'll deal with it. I, I told my girlfriend I'm not going to drink at her house because... She hasn't drank for a long time herself, and I don't want to bring that into the house. Um, good, that'll be good for you. Yeah, yeah, I'll lose some of this face fat and <laughs> my body in shape. We got to be in shape. We got to get ready for the fight, Vicky. There's a there's a fight on every corner now. We're in our sixties. Every corner is a fight for health. There's a health fight all the time. Health battles. That's the sixties and seventies. I can't wait. Can't wait. Have you been other than the COVID stuff? Have you been healthy? Yeah, except for that pneumonia seven, eight years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nothing, no, nothing major. I'm not wood. I'm, uh, 
I don't even go work out anymore. I'm always with the dog, and I never leave her alone in the hotel room. I, when I go to Vegas, I'll hopefully start running again and walking briskly, put it that way, or hit the gym, you know, hit the gym, do a couple of circuits and feel good again. Cause I miss that feeling. Um, mm -hmm. It leaves you real quick, but muscles have a good memory. I can get that stuff back. I'm not going to look cut up, but I'll feel better if I'm in the gym. It's just a, my, a state of mind thing. You know, I'm about to start myself. We started a fat burn diet today and uh, I have to, go it's, it's, it's basically no sugar, no fat, no carbs, no fun. And it's just, protein and vegetables. It's really horrible, but want to have gained some pounds, want to lose them. And I also haven't worked out in six months. Cause I've had uh, all yeah. these, I've had yeah. all these sciatic. I mean, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, 67. No, Shit starts yeah. happening. AJ. I know. I know. Like I, not... Listen, sciatic. I had two operations. I had very bad sciatic when I was in the daily news and I had two operations on my disc in a row, Oh, both, both herniated discs and it came back again. Then I went to a really good doctor in New York hospital and he, he, he got me past it, but he told me it's going to hurt for a while because your nerve was the color of a fire engine. It should be pink. It was red, red, red. And it's, it has a memory. It's going to hurt for a while. And then little by little, it came back. It went, I went back to feeling okay again. But that's what started the Percocet addiction because that pain was unbearable. It's un it's I used yeah, to hail a it, cab on my knees in the city and I'd lay in the cab and then lay down on the Daily News and take my phone on the floor and then take five more Percocets at noon, and then five oh. more at four. I mean, I was insane. I had a really crooked doctor who would give me like 300 patient care back then. So uh, yeah, I got hooked on those, but I was able to work and do TV and keep the engine going. Yeah, I didn't want to miss out. I didn't want to, you know, back, I forget back then, I didn't want to lose a job. I didn't want to be left out. Like, he can't do it anymore. When we're young, we think about how much we have to hustle and keep that job and keep that, you know, that, that gig and, we do things to our bodies that aren't that good, but we keep so, the energy going. So, do, AJ, do you feel now doing your show every day, doing the high stakes poker, having this new start with this girlfriend, is is life where you want it now? Are you are you good with this? Are you ambitious for something else? Or are you good with this? No, no, I'm I'm very happy. Uh, I'm very happy with her, without a doubt. I think she'll be a big key in. Um, me uh, loving myself again and just having someone love you again. It's a, it's a wonderful feeling to be loved and cherished and have someone to talk to all the time. And we're like, her and I talk six, seven times a day. Then we'll, we'll talk for an hour and a half at night. We're still like teenagers about this, um, about this stuff. So yeah, I'm in a great spot where I am right now. Um, money can be an issue here and there, you know, patrons go down, they go back up. It's a very fluctuate. My, my income fluctuates kind of stuff. So that gets me nuts. But um all in all, I'm doing the jobs I love to do. I've got a, an audience that loves to hear me. I get to do cool shit like this. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling good. I'm good. I'm in a good, really good spot. Really good spot. Well, I'm really happy to hear that. And I so appreciate you doing this, even though I know you weren't feeling well today. And you're well, a trooper. And When do I get to see you except for your show? I never see you. I know, but I'm so glad. But we come to Vegas. We, oh, we were just oh, in Vegas good. last weekend. So we'll have to good. get together and all, all have right, dinner and stuff. I would, I would love, love that. that. All right, doll. Thank you I'll so much, you soon, AJ. Feel well. Love you Take too. Care.